to learn 35. I'm glad he set me free one day. Amen. Uh, I was in prison. Got out when I got saved. Number 235. Everybody standing. Everybody singing this morning. Uh, it's a little bit nasty outside, but it's fixing to clear up. And then hit us again this evening. So let's all sing. 235. He's set free. Singing out real big and loud. Amen. Come on now. Everybody sing. Once like a bird in prison, I dwell. No freedom from my sorrow I fell. But Jesus came and he listened to me. Set me free. Now, hold on a second. We're gonna find out what that racket is, y'all. Is that it? Can't be coming out of there. I'm hearing, I'm hearing it in the speaker. Is that coming out of that amplifier? How can you tell that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. All right. Let's try it again. Second verse. We'll get this worked out before everybody gets here. Did you hear right there? Now let's try it. It ain't that mic. It ain't that amplifier. It's piano. Boy. Number two. Now I am climbing higher each day. Darkness of night has drifted away. My feet are planted on higher ground. And glory to God, I'm homeward bound. He set me free, yes, he set me free. And he broke the bond of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see. Oh, glory to God, he set me free. Amen. Number three. Last verse, ready? Everybody ready? Goodbye to sin and things that confound. Thought of this world shall turn me around. Daily I'm working, I'm praying to, and glory to God. I'm going through. He set me free, yes, he set me free, and he broke up a, a prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see for glory to God. He set me free. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Sure is a blessing to see everybody out today. I uh, want you to hope, make yourself at home, enjoy the Lord, uh, get a blessing. We do have a crowd of people coming here this morning, but it's it's amazing. They say 20 drops of rain keeps 19 Baptists out of church, and that's pitiful. Uh, that's pitiful, but uh, we do have people on the way. We'll have a good crowd today, I'm sure. I'm hoping we'll get this bad weather over with this weekend, so it'll be nice the next couple weekends. Uh, Eastern Youth Rally and also uh, let's everybody enjoy the Lord this morning. Hope you've had a good week. We're fixing to bear down hard, y'all. I need everybody's help and cooperation for the Youth Rally. Everybody's help and cooperation. Can't put on something this big uh, by myself and me and 10 others can't. We need everybody's help and cooperation. So if you'll do that here in the next <clears throat> three weeks from Today, the big nights will be over with. So uh, we're running out of time. Let's get busy. Let's uh, uh, enjoy God's blessings this morning. Thank everybody for going down to sing Friday night. We had a great time. Big crowd went, and revival's good. So let's uh, let's pray this morning. We want to be remembering the prayer family of Ronnie Loftus. I preached Ronnie's funeral yesterday. Uh, and he used to sit right back there on the back row every Sunday morning for Sunday school. And he's in eternity. He's on home to be the Lord. 
didn't get sick till last summer. So remember him and prayer, their family in prayer this morning. And then don't forget, um, uh, Miss Desi's going to have to have a little surgery tomorrow morning. Is it tomorrow morning? Tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow, uh, remember her in prayer uh, also. And uh, a lot of other folks that's been sick. And uh, Larry Blake, remember Larry used to drive a bus. He's not doing good at all. He's in the hospital in Marion. And so remember him in prayer too. So if you got something else to pray for this morning, let it be known up today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we sure do thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have by our heads and our hearts before you and call you our Father. We ask you, Lord, this morning that you would forgive us of all of our sin, everything we've said, everything we've done, not according to the will of God or not like the Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive us and wash us in the blood. Thank you for the good revival this week, for all the people that got their heart right. In the good time of fellowship, I pray for those churches all over this morning. Every preacher, every pastor, every evangelist, every missionary, any teacher, anybody trying to do something for you today, I pray you bless them. Now, Lord, do what ought to be done here today. Touch every single heart. Save souls. Touch lives. Bless our buses coming in. Lord, I pray for those that are sick in the hospital and, and not in the hospital, too, that you'd help them. I pray for those that are dragging. Lord, just cold and backslid got messed up in sin God get a hold of their heart this morning God bring conviction bring them back to church I pray you'd fill this place full of people and power and praise this morning for the glory of God do what ought to be done in every life we'll thank you and praise you we'll give you the glory for what's accomplished but we ask it in Jesus name for his sake amen amen all right let's get our Bibles up now Amen. All right. Well, it's good to see y'all. Hope we have a few more coming on in here in a few minutes. So uh, let's go ahead and get right into the Word this morning. Psalm 119, once again. Been in this chapter a while now. There's a lot in it, a lot of good stuff. And I'll tell you, when you're um, reading your Bible through, don't be in such a hurry that you miss what you're reading. There's a lot. Of, if you're just sitting... Uh, look at the verses that you're reading and just see, okay, what is that really saying and learn to compare it with other scriptures. There's a lot of good stuff in this book, a lot of stuff that we don't always notice. And the good thing about it is no matter how many times you read it, you're not going to get it all in one time. You're going to come back and read it again. You'll notice something you never saw before. Then you'll do it. I mean, that's the way it is. It's a continual uh, learning and growing thing. There's verses uh, that my wife and I have read this time, and we've read the Bible through together before that I will look at and say, I don't remember that verse. I don't remember reading it. And um, that's the way the Word of God is. So uh, that's why I like to take a chapter or a book uh, like we did with Romans and like we're doing with this chapter and just and just take our time and go through it. So Psalm 119, once again, uh, longest chapter in the Bible by far. Um, I don't think, let's see, it's 176 verses. I know, as far as I know, there's not even another one that even has 100 verses in it. Uh, I know Luke chapter 1 has 80, and I'm not sure if that's the second longest or not, but uh, uh, this is by far the longest. So what I want to do this morning is pick up about verse 72. I think that's where we stopped. Um, <clears throat> and again, we just notice all the many references to God's Word uh, in this chapter. And verse 72 says, The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Now that's that verse right there goes against the world's philosophy entirely. The world's basically saying, you know, you need to get a good education, get a good paying job and save up money. And again, if you can do all that, that's, that's fine. Nothing, nothing wrong with any of that, but um, there's more to life than just making money folks. There's more to life than just having wealth and uh, having money and going on trips and having a nice car and having a nice house. There's, there's gotta be more to this existence than that. Because you know what? At the end of your life, none of that's going to matter to you. When it comes time to die, you're not going to say, yeah, but I'm at peace because I had a nice car. You're not going to say I'm at peace because I had the best house in the neighborhood or, or let, look at my bank account. You're not taking any of that with you when you go. And uh, if, if we as Christians, and again, I'm not, I'm not telling you not to work. The Bible says you ought to work. The Bible says you ought to be a good steward of your money. Um, I, there, there are a lot of good biblical principles about money. Money is not wrong. 
You hear a lot of people that don't know the Bible and don't read it, they'll say, ah, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. No, it don't say that. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. You got to have money to survive. I mean, try going down to the grocery store and buying something without it. Um, and you say, well, I use my card, but at some point you got to pay that, you know, so the money comes in. You got to have, have some money. Um, in fact, uh, one of my favorite movies of all time is a Christmas movie. It's a Wonderful Life. How many of y'all seen that? How many of y'all love it as much as I do? I love that movie. Um, one of the I, I love some of the the dry humor in it, and one of them is right after um, you know his guardian angel jumps in the river to keep him from jumping off the bridge, and he jumps in, pulls the angel out, and saves his life. Uh, if you remember, uh, he's he's uh, George Bailey is the guy's name. He's in debt eight thousand dollars, and he's facing jail time. So the guy keeps saying, "I'm your guardian angel." And he says, I'm here to help you. He says, you don't happen to have $8,000, do you? And uh, he says, oh, no, we don't have money in heaven where I come. He says, yeah, well, it sure comes in handy down here, you know, and it does. So uh, not against money, but I'll tell you something. If your goal in life is to just make a lot of money, you're, you're missing what life is about. Um, the Bible says here, the law of thy mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver. It's okay to have some gold and silver, but I'll tell you something, you're a whole lot better with nothing and the Word of God and living by it because God can bless you and God, God will provide for you and take care of you. Uh, and I think as Christians, maybe we need to value the Word of God above material possessions. Maybe we need to value the Word of God and what it says for our lives above um, any goal that we might have in life of, of accomplishing this or doing this or seeing this. You know, I'm a person that likes to see things and go places. That's not a secret to anybody, I don't think. I like to see things and um, I like to travel. But I'll tell you something right now, brother. I'd rather ne never leave Caldwell County and know God than I had to go the, uh, travel the whole world and miss out on heaven. I got news for you. Heaven's better than any place you're going to go down here anyway. Amen. Uh, so I think as Christians, we need to understand the law of thy mouth, the, the law of God, the word of God ought to mean more to us literally than any material possession in the world. And if it does, we'll read it. If it does, we'll try to apply it. If it does, we'll love this. I think you ought to love this book. I think there ought to be a zeal in you to pick this book up and say, what can I get from the Lord? How close can I get to the Lord today when I read this? I think we ought to have that zeal when we pick up the Bible and read it. Uh, the thing about the scriptures is there's going to be verses you don't understand sometimes. Um, I don't I don't know of anybody that has it all figured out. I don't know of anybody. Uh, the one thing about it, though, like I said a minute ago, you keep reading it regularly, you'll start noticing things you've never noticed before. The Lord will show you something different, uh, and it's it's a lifelong process. Um, but the thing about it is, you know enough now in this book to keep you busy till Jesus comes. You know, you understand enough about it now. Uh, that's why all these people say, well, we, we need new versions because we don't understand the King James. I guarantee you understand enough in here to keep you busy for the Lord. You, you understand that much, don't you? Um, and we don't need to rewrite the Bible. We need to reread it. Amen. All right. Let's, um, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm not going to take every verse of the chapter because we'd be in the chapter for two years if I do. So I'm going to skip down verse 83. And I'm going to read a verse here. And I actually had to do some study on this verse because I read it about 10 times. I could not figure out what it meant. And really, it's easy. Uh, it was easy once I uh, ran some references on it. I am like, how did I miss that? Uh, but I'm going to throw it out there and see if anybody else wants to take a stab at it. Uh, the Bible says, verse 83, For I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I, do, do I not forget thy statutes. Anybody want to take a shot at that? What does it mean I'm become like a bottle in the smoke? Just one at a time, please. Just one at a time. Let's, let's keep order in here, people. All right. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Don't feel bad. I read it the same way, and I was like, okay. Um, well, I was, did a little study on bottles back then. I don't know if they had glass or not. I'm not saying there wasn't glass. But primarily, the bottles they used was made out of skins or hides. They were like leather. They were leather bottles. And uh, Jesus makes reference to that in the New Testament, talking about uh, when they when they make new wine, you don't put it into an old bottle because the bacteria that had been in that uh, in there from the fermentation process will spoil the new wine that's in there. And when it expands, it'll cause the bottle to break. So that's why he said you put it in new bottles. He also wasn't talking about a glass bottle. He was talking about a bottle made of hide. Now, the thing is, if you take a bottle that's made out of... Um, uh, of skin or hide and you put it over a fire or smoke, it shrivels up and dries up. And that's what he's saying there. There's times I feel like I'm dried up. You ever been there? 
You ever been where you think, where you feel like there's times I just feel like my spiritual life is just shriveled up to nothing? I've been there. I mean, I'd be lying to you if I said I hadn't been. There's going to be those times in your life. The question is, what are you going to do during them times? Are you going to, are you going to give up? Are you going to quit? Are you going to get discouraged and throw in the towel? Are you just going to say, look, I thought, I, you know, I thought this was just all going to be a good feeling all the time. I thought it was just going to be prosperity and blessing and happiness and, and joy and peace and, and all that stuff. And everything's just going to go smooth. But have you ever been to the place where you just, let's be honest. I don't, you know, really want to, um, Spend a long time on this because we should never ever blame God for our problems. But if you're not careful, the devil will get on your shoulder. Sometimes he'll start saying, look, you've been trying to serve God. If the Lord loved you, why is he letting this happen to you? Now that's when you get to that place where you have to decide, okay, am I just going to go with what my emotions are telling me right now? I mean, look, I have been at times in my life where I felt like that bottle in the smoke it had just been, it had just dried out. It was just shriveled up. It was nothing. Didn't even know if God would ever use me again. And, uh, you know, it's those times you got to decide I'm either going to quit and just give up or I'm going to keep fighting because I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he's able. And that's what we got to decide. And he said, and even David says here, he says, there's times I've become like a bottle in the smoke. Can you imagine? Look at all the things David went through. Some of it was self-induced. There's no question that when the sword didn't depart from his house, that was due to his sin. We know that. The Lord told him because of his sin that, the, that he was going to have trouble the rest of his days, and he did. He lost a son, uh, the, the child that he had conceived in adultery. He lost that son in death. Uh, he had another son that uh, raped uh, one of his daughters, and then he had another son that tried to uh, overthrow him and take his throne. And that son ended up being killed. And, and uh, David's life was marked by trouble the rest of his days. But um, even prior to that, David had trouble. He had Saul trying to kill him every time he turned around. He had Saul constantly pursuing him because Saul wanted Jonathan, his son, to be the next king. And the Lord had already said that's not how it's going to happen. And Saul somehow got the idea that he could overthrow God's plan, I guess, and that he was going to outsmart God. And the Lord had already said, you know, that he had chosen David to be king and in Solomon or in Saul's place. And then um, David was constantly running and fleeing for his life. Uh, a couple of times Saul tried to nail him to the wall with a spear. And uh, just, it was just constant, one thing after another. And there had to be times in David's life, he's like, Lord, you told me I was going to be the next king. I didn't know I was going to spend the rest of my time running for my life. Now, um, you know, we all face times where we just feel like the Lord's not there, that he's not listening. Don't we? Let's be honest. But you know what he said? Yet do I not forget thy statutes. There's times when you're down to nothing spiritually and you just have to put your nose in the book anyway. Something Brother Danny said several years ago, and I like it. I've used it a few times. We spend a lot of time on Facebook, but maybe we need to spend some time getting our face in the book. That's Listen, I like to see what y'all are doing sometimes. Sometimes some stuff y'all post, I really don't care, to be honest with you. Um, don't care where you ate. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, don't, I don't care that you're at Walmart. I hope you find what you need. If you shop at ours, you don't. That's the worst stocked Walmart there's ever been. Uh, half the time you go there and you can't find what you need. I'm not talking about the one here in Morganton now. I'm talking about one near where I live. Um, you got a Walmart employee here throws her hands up at me. So, no, I, I live in Granite Falls and they're about out of half the stuff half all the time. So, uh, I'm telling the truth, ain't I? Okay. Um, what was I? How did I get off on Walmart? Oh, yeah. Uh, talking about Facebook. Some of the stuff that y'all, you know, post is okay. And I don't mind. You know, I kind of like seeing how everybody's doing. Um, there's a lot of bad stuff that can be done with social media, as we know. Uh, uh, you can share prayer requests through it and give scriptures that uplift. You can do a lot of things. It's just, you know, it's, it's a tool, uh, to depending on how you use it. Some of y'all don't really use it right, in my opinion, but that's, that's another message. Um, but here's the thing about it, though. Instead of spending as much time on that, there might be times in your life you, you might need some extra Bible in your spirit. You might need to get your face in the book. You might need to get on your knees. And I'm going to tell you something right now. That's the answer when you feel like you're uh, dried up and shriveled up. That's what you need to do. You don't need to say, now here, this is why I don't, I don't understand this. this is, uh, please help me on this kind of thinking. I've talked, and it ain't even any one person I'm thinking of. This is since I was pastor and I, I dealt with this constantly. And I don't understand the mentality behind it. I guess because, you know, I've had those same feelings in my life. I've had those same battles. I've tripped and fell on my face, but I've never backslid and got out of church. When I say backslid, I mean, there's been times that I've not been where I should be with the Lord, but I've never just quit church. There's never been one time a pastor had to come to my house and say, where you been? 
And I, just, I, don't, I don't get when you hear people say something like, preacher, I've got a lot going on right now and just everything's going wrong. And I just, I just, I'll be back to church when I get it worked out. Now, let me tell you how smart that is. That's like you walk outside and you fall off this embankment down here and you break both your legs. And I say, okay, let's get you to the hospital. No, my legs are broke right now. And I'll go to the hospital when I get better. You're missing the point of what the hospital's there for. The hospital's there to fix your legs, not just to make you comfortable and not just so you can have... They don't bring you in there and say, oh, well, I'm sorry, your legs are broke. Here, we'll put you in a bed, say as long as you need to, we'll try to make you cut. No, they're going to go in there and they're going to try to fix your legs. You know, you don't sit there when you when you got your legs broke and say, I'll go to the hospital when my legs get healed. That, that does sound funny, but that's how funny some of y'all sound. You say, well, I'll go to church and I get everything worked out. No, that, that's why you come. You come when you need it the most. What do you think we come for? What, what is church for? Is church so we come and see what our boss is wearing? That's what most of y'all is going to do next Sunday, ain't it? Oh, I got this new dress. Oh, she's wearing that same dress. I'm, 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 I'm going to get away from that because I always, once I get off on that, I, 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 don't, I don't understand why that is a problem that somebody has the same. What did you, when you bought it, did you think they just made one? I mean, is nobody else in your church allowed to shop there and like the same dress you liked? That's ridiculous. I, you know, I wore a white dress shirt this morning. I did not once think, now I wonder who else is going to be wearing a white dress shirt. And I wonder if they're going to look better in it than me. And, you know, and, and oh, does it make me look fat? And, you know, all that, you know. Like I said, let's get away from that. But why do we come to church? We don't come to church to see what everybody's wearing. We don't come to church to impress people. Well, look at them. They're spiritual. We come to church to get what we need from God, folks. And if you're feeling like you're just shriveled up and you're dried up, this is where you need to be. Because there's something about the uh, hearing the preaching of the word, being around where people are singing and shouting and worshiping that just gives you what you need and it gives you strength and it gives you what you need to go on and go through that trial that you're go uh, going through. And I'm telling you right now, the worst thing you can do is just quit and go and sit at home and feel sorry for yourself. That's why he said, I've become like a bottle in the smoke, yet I do not forget thy statutes. It's the first thing we tend to do sometimes. It's just, oh, Lord, why are you letting this happen? No, the first thing y'all do is get in the Word. Amen. See what the Bible says about it. Has anybody got anything on that? Anybody got a... Yes. That's it. That's all, we, that's all any of us ever are, right. is one heartbeat from the Lord. You know, it's, it's something how a day can change. And, and I read a story yesterday. I don't know when it happened. If it happened maybe the day before. I didn't know about it until yesterday. Very, very sad story. Um... Up in uh, Minnesota, uh, the Mall of America, up there. I don't know how many of y'all heard about this little guy, five-year-old boy. Uh, he's in that mall, and I, I've been in that mall one time. And like where you go down here to the mall in Hickory, it's two stories, and you look over the railing down to the first. That was like, well, I don't know, eight or ten stories. It's like different levels, I, at least seven. I'm going to say it's eight or ten stories high. Anyway, there's a little boy on the third third uh, level up there. You picture the Valley Hills Mall in Hickory, but up one more level. He's on the third level, and he accidentally bumps into a man. And the man just picks him up, throws him over the railing. Y'all read about that? That's unbelievable. Uh, just picks him up, and the guy was a Muslim. And for some reason, the state of Minnesota, that's my wife's home state, and I never uh, fail to throw that up to her, is becoming a stronghold of mu uh, for Muslims in this country, especially around the Minneapolis area where the Muslims are located. There's Muslims everywhere. And... Um, this guy, for whatever reason, apparently belongs to a Muslim group that had called for terrorist attacks in malls. So he picks up, I mean, a little five-year-old boy bumps into you by accident, and you don't say, oh, that's all right, little guy. You pick him up, throw him over the rail on third floor. And, and I had heard yesterday that he had died, and then I heard he didn't, that he's still in the hospital. So y'all pray for that boy. I don't know what his state is. But I'm going to tell you something. That family just went to the mall that day. That little boy was a happy five-year-old boy, and now he's fighting for his life. That's how quick your life can change. We are just literally, like she said, one heartbeat from eternity. And I'm going to tell you something right now. There are no excuse for somebody doing that to it. There ain't no excuse for doing that anyway. Uh, unless somebody, unless it's a grown adult trying to kill you or something, then you, you, I mean, that's one thing. But to take a little five-year-old boy and throw him over the railing, he falls three stories onto the floor. I mean, what kind of devil do you have to be possessed with to do something like that? 
But see, the thing is, there ain't none of us promised tomorrow. You know something I tell my wife, because I've heard of this happening several times now. I tell my wife, when you're driving down the road, and I'm going to be honest with you, one of the reasons I think I've avoided a lot of accidents on the highway, and I've had some close calls, I trust nobody. I do not trust anybody. You say, well, what if, you, if I pass you, brother? I don't trust you either. No, I mean, I do. I, I, you know, I do as far as, but I'm always watching everything around me when I'm driving. And I've avoided a lot of wrecks doing that because once in a while you'll get some person who just ain't paying attention. They're not a bad person. They'll just try to start. You'll be in the left lane coming up beside them. They'll start to merge right over. That's happened to me 15 times probably. And, uh, but uh, I told my wife the other day, I said, I want you to start watching every time you go uh, under an overpass. I want you to look up that overpass. You know why? Because there's nuts that think it's funny to throw cinder blocks off of those things into cars. All you have to be doing is driving from point A to point B and somebody do something like that and they come in your windshield and hit you and kill you. There are a lot of ways to die. And um, I'll tell you something, brother. It, it's to the point where you better be ready to meet God because you don't know, but I'll get right with God on my deathbed. You might not get one. You might get taken out of here in an instant. Or like she said, your heart might just quit beating. And I'll tell you something. You need to be ready to meet the Lord uh, when that comes. I wouldn't let the problems of this life get me to discouraged in the Lord because the Lord's been good. I just keep my focus on Him. You'll go through life a lot better that way. Anybody got anything before we move on? Question, comment? Yes. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, that's, that's, I've seen a lot of people, there's a lot of people that I'll be sitting here this morning that used to come and are not here. And what's happened is they, a lot of cases, they've gotten discouraged, bitter, things didn't go their way, and they blame the Lord. Listen, first of all, don't blame the Lord because we live in a world with a, sin, a curse of sin on it and death. And the Lord told us it would be that way. When man chose to rebel back in the garden, the Lord said this act is going to bring death. It's going to bring death. It's going to bring hardship and heartache. And listen, that's the world we live in. And the Lord didn't even have to give us the promise of eternal life, but he did. Be thankful for what he's done instead of blaming him for things that go wrong. And you know, and anybody else got anything on that before we move on? Anybody else? All right. Uh, let's jump down about verse 86. Uh, the Bible says, all thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully, help thou me. We'll take the first part of that verse. All thy commandments are faithful. Did you know that everything God commands is right and for your good? It, here's the thing. We don't have any problem obeying the commands if it's something we don't want to do anyway. But if it's something we want to do, we find a way to rationalize around it. We, well, I don't see what's really wrong. The question, not whether you see what's wrong with it. The question is, did the Lord tell you not to do it? Did you know, and I'm not trying to be ugly here, but did you know God don't have to explain his reasons to you? He don't have to. He's not obligated. He's God. Okay. How many times have you told your, I don't think that's right. How many times have you told your own child because I said so? Anybody in here, you've never said that to your child. But why? Because I said so. Anybody in here, you've never said that. How many in here have said that? Then don't get mad at God if he says that. Okay, now there's things that the Lord commands that the reasons are obvious. Okay, um, thou shalt not steal. It don't belong to you. Don't steal. I, mean, I, I don't have any problem figuring that out. But then there's commands that you say, Lord, what was really the reason, the purpose behind that? It's okay to try to research on it. But what's not okay is to try to rationalize it and say, well, I just, I, I don't want to live like that. I don't see nothing wrong with it. Then you are your own final authority. It's either you're the final authority or God is. The Bible says here that all thy commandments are faithful. I believe everything God said thou shalt not is because it will be harmful to you. I don't believe the Lord said thou shalt not one time just because he don't want you to have fun and he wants to mess your life up and he just wants you to be miserable. I don't believe the Lord told you anything for that, for that reason. I believe that he has given us... Uh, they, uh, he's put fence around things that, you know, said, okay, this is okay in this context, like, like, I'll, I'll be honest, like, like sex, a uh, sexual relationship. Uh, that is, God put a fence around it, and the fence is marriage. Within marriage, it's right. Outside of marriage, it's dirty. 
That's, that, that's as simple as I can put it. And you know what? You know what a lot of people in church today wonder? They'll say, well, I just don't see the problem. If, if two adults are in love, the problem, you know what the problem is? You're your own final authority. You're not listening to what God said about it. Now, who's the authority here? You or him? That's, that's, that's what it is. Then there's other commandments that, um, oh, that we love, telling our children, the Bible says you have to honor your father. Now, we love that one as parents, don't we? A child sitting there, yeah, but they're wrong. Why do you? Listen, just do what God says. Isn't that just a good principle to live by? If the Lord said it, I'm going to do it. I, whether I figure it out or whether I don't figure it out, I'm going to do it because I trust him that he wants my good and he has my best interest at heart. Is that, is that what the verse is saying here? All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me. Now, let me say something about that. Just believing the Bible, just being here this morning and being a Bible-believing Christian is enough reason for this world to persecute you. That's what it says. They persecute me wrongfully. Didn't say they did it rightfully. It didn't say they had a reason. They did it wrongfully. The world don't like what you stand for. Now, if you doubt that, just take your hand about a handful of Bible tracts and go out and hand them out to people. And you're going to get, I, listen, there will not be one time that you don't get this mixture of reaction. You'll get some people that take it and say, thank you. You will get some people that say, well, I'm already a Christian, but thank you for what you're doing. Then you will get some nuts that say, uh, I'm a Christian, and I think what you're doing out here is terrible. I'm trying to force your religion down everybody. It's like, well, yeah, you need to get saved is what you need. Okay. Uh, Jesus said, uh, preach the gospel to every creature. I don't know how you get from that. Keep, that. That means keep it to yourself. I don't know how you get that. Uh, but then you'll get people that, I don't even believe in God. Well, last time, um, I want to say it was right before Halloween. Um, the last time we as a church did, it was up here in front of the Walmart in Morganton. And uh, I remember handing a guy one, I don't need that. I said, well, why not? I ain't going to hurt you to read it. He said, because I don't believe in God. It's like, well, um, and you know me, when somebody says something like that, I'm not, well, okay, have a nice day. I'm like, I want to talk. He didn't want to talk, so we didn't talk. Uh, but let me tell you something. Just believing this book, identifying yourself with this book, will subject you to ridicule. People will laugh at you. Toughen up. Listen, can I be up front with you here? Uh, we've heard too much watered down preached on TV that we think being a Christian is just supposed to be wonderful all the time. And it is wonderful as far as having peace in your heart and knowing where you're going. But I'll tell you something. We've got this idea that, that if we're just really where we ought to be with God, everything's just always going to go smooth and you ain't never going to get sick and you're always going to prosper and everybody's going to love you. No, people are going to hate you. They're not going to like what you stand for. If I, listen, if I walk through downtown Morgan and carrying a Bible, I'm going to get some looks. If I'm carrying a novel, nobody's going to look twice at me. If I'm carrying um, a notebook, nobody's going to look at me twice. They may, well, he's just writing something down. Carry a Bible through there and watch the looks you get. It automatically identifies you. It's kind of like when you go to a ball game. You can tell who's on what side by what they're wearing. Well, when, you, when you're a Christian, people can tell whose side you own by what you believe. And if you're carrying that Bible, they're automatically going to uh, bow up and they're going to say, well, I don't know about that. They're going to feel, feel uncomfortable around you. And that's what he said. They persecute me wrongly. All right. Um, you know what you do when that happens? Just keep doing what you're doing. Just keep doing right. There's people that have actually quit in the face of persecution. And can I be honest with you? We have not seen persecution in this country on just a very minute scale. Now, if we keep on, we're going to. You say, keep on what? Well, I can get political this morning. If we keep on electing Muslims to uh, be lawmakers in this country, you say, well, I don't like it. Well, look, uh, I had somebody the other day call me a racist for saying something about Muslims. I said, first of all, Islam is not a race. It's a religion. Okay, they, i got no problem with anybody of any race. But I do have a problem with certain religious principles that tell you to kill infidels and anybody that doesn't convert ought to be slain and, and that denies that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I said, I do have an issue with that. And let, me, let me tell you something. Being anti-Islam has nothing to do with a race of any kind. And I don't. People, that's how dumb people are. They don't even know what racism is anymore, I guess. But nothing racist about that. But if we continue to elect them to office... Um, I've always wondered this thing. You know, some of them want that Sharia law here in America. Uh, and you've got these poor liberal democratic young women who know nothing, probably couldn't spell their own name right. And somebody, you ask them on the street, what do you think about the Muslims want Sharia law? Oh, I just think that's wonderful. Then in the next breath, they're like, we need to stand up for the rights of women. Do you know what Sharia law is, you nut? 
You have zero rights as a woman under Sharia law. Your dad can decide to kill you if he chooses. Okay? So tell me some more about what you know about the best, what's best for this country. I'm, I don't want to get off on politics this morning, but um, I'm going to tell you something, folks. Um, it says they persecute you wrongly. Just stand for the Lord and people's not going to like you. They're going to feel, you will get accused of being judgmental and you don't have to say nothing. I mean, I'll give you an example of that. I, I think I mentioned this before. I know I've mentioned this before, but I'll mention this context. When my wife, not the job she works at now, um, but it's about what, four years ago, maybe right before Christmas, um, all the ladies in the bank she worked for at that time were going to uh, pick a restaurant and go out and uh, eat at for uh, for a Christmas. Uh, I don't want to say party, but just a Christmas. Stuff. And it was kind of really uneasy about, you know, my wife's uneasy about going to that, and I was uneasy about her going. But uh, what they did at work, they just decided each of them would write down a piece of paper, a restaurant of their choosing, and they would throw it in a hat, and the, somebody would draw, and whichever restaurant was drawn, that's where they'd go. Well, my wife wrote down Cracker Barrel. Okay, and um, guess what was drawn? Cracker Barrel. Lady drawing it out, looks and goes, and that smile just disappears. She goes, we ain't going to go to Cracker Barrel. So why not? Because they don't have drinks there. Now, that's dumb. I've never been to Cracker Barrel and not got something to drink. They got drinks. They got tea and is it Pepsi or Coke products. They got milk and they got water. You will not get dehydrated going to Cracker Barrel. Not going to oh, obey what she meant. I think what she meant was they don't serve liquor where we can go there and make fools of ourselves because it's on the bank's dime and they're paying for it. We're going to go get drunk. That's what they meant. So uh, they changed the rules. The rule was whatever name's picked, that's where we go. Well, the wrong one was picked. So they said, well, we ain't going to do it. Well, I said, well, I ain't going because all the other ones was, was bars. Well, I said, well, I'm not going to go. And you know what? And that's all my wife said. You know what her manager says? You're judging us. All she said was, I'm not going. She didn't say, you bunch of heathens. She, Did you? Okay. Uh, my understanding was she did, and I wasn't there. Uh, but my understanding was she just said, well, I'm not going to be able to go. And uh, I feel like you're judging us. That's what her manager told her. You are judging us. She said, I'm saying nothing. Y'all are adults. You can do as you please. But for us, Christmas is when we celebrate the birth of Christ, and I don't use it as a time to drink alcohol. And I don't want to be at a table where it's being drunk. So, um, but my point is, you can get accused of judging just by taking a stand. You don't even have to say anything about what they're doing. Just say, well, I can't do that. And, well, who, who are you? They, only God can judge. But listen, they'll wrongfully persecute you. You know what you do? You just do what's right anyway. You just don't change. You just say, look, I know in my heart I'm doing what's right. I know my motives are right. Um, take it or leave it. Anybody got anything on that? Anybody got a thought before we move on? All right. Um, verse 87. They had almost consumed me upon earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. That kind of, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It kind of goes in line with verse 83 that we read about the bottle and the smoke. They had almost consumed me, talking about the people who were persecuting him. He felt like that everybody was against him. You ever feel like everybody in the world's against you and you're the only one doing right? You ever had the Elijah syndrome? You know what that is? I'm the only one that hasn't bowed. That's what Elijah thought. Now, really, he wasn't. But Elijah was kind of feeling, after a great victory, I've never understood that part. After a great victory on Mount Carmel, the man calls fire down from heaven and slew all the false prophets. And the next chapter, he's running scared for his life from a woman and says, Lord, just kill me before she gets a hold of me. The next chapter, I don't mean a year later. I'm talking about the next chapter. He said, there, Lord, just kill me. It's better that I'm dead than have to run from Jezebel. And, and uh, he says, I, you know, I'm, only, I'm the only one that hasn't compromised. You ever start feeling, listen, you're getting a little bit of pride when you start thinking you're the only one that's doing right. Because what happens is you look around a lot of people that ain't doing right. But you forget there still are people that are doing right. You get your eyes on the ones that aren't, and you forget, and you start thinking, well, I'm all alone, Lord. It would just be best if I was just with you because I'm the only well, if, if that's the case, if you are the only one doing right, the world needs you here. You need to be setting an example. But, you know, Elijah was like, oh, Lord, just take me out because I'm the only one. Everybody else is compromisers. And um, kind of David, David here kind of had that. Uh, he says, they've almost consumed me upon earth. Everybody's against me, Lord. And all those that have persecuted me wrongly, I just feel like I'm about to give up. But he said, but I forsook not thy precepts. All I can tell you is this. 
And that's all I can do is tell you. I can't make you do it when the time comes. It's easy to agree with it now if you're not going through something. It's easy to say, yep, that's what we ought to do. It's a lot harder to do it, though, when you are going through something. All I can do is tell you and hope you'll remember it when something does come your way. And you say, you know what? We had that Sunday school lesson where we were told that no matter how bad it gets, just hold on to the Lord anyway. That's all you can do. That's, all, that's, really all you, that's what you should do. When I had cancer, that's what I did. What else was there to do besides hold on to the Lord? What, what, what else? Can, what's better than that? What gives you a better solution than that? And you just put it in God's hand. Man, if your life's in God's hands, that's the best, best place for it to be. So that's what David said here. But I forsook not thy precepts. Verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen. Uh, forever his word is settled in heaven. That means it don't need to change. We don't need to try to change it. The Lord's not going to change his mind. That's why I get so tired of hearing people say, look, preacher, I appreciate you, your stand, but it's 2019. Um, it don't say till 2019 the Lord's word is settled in heaven. Forever. That means what was right 50 years ago is still right. It's going to be right next week. What was wrong is going to be wrong next week, and it's still wrong today. We somehow think, I mean, listen, God does not adapt to the times. The Lord does not change His standards to fit what society's standards are. And we need, to, we need to get that. We really do. I think a lot of churches have fallen into that trap. They lower the standard uh, to try to get to be what they call more relevant. Let's, let's make our church more relevant. What you mean is we're going to try to be more like the world so they'll come. I think that's kind of what you're saying there. Um, I'll tell, tell you what I believe, and I believe it's the Bible. I believe when you come to the house of God, y'all treat it with respect. Y'all treat it as a, as a holy place. I know this is a building. I know it's just made of building material, but it's a place where we worship God. You ought to treat it with respect. You shouldn't come here and fuss and fight and argue and cause discord. You ought to dress right when you come here. You ought to cover yourself up. Okay? You ought to dress like you're coming to church. And, you know, I don't say that a whole lot, but uh, I'm just going to say it right here because... Uh, we need to respect the house of the Lord. His, his word is settled forever in heaven. We don't need to be changing what's right, folks, especially when it comes to the word of God. Now, I'm going to bring the Bible. I'm going to probably finish up on this verse. I'm going to bring the Bible issue into this for just a minute. I know I've hit on that a lot lately and said a lot about it. Um, you'll always be able to tell what I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos about because it comes out when I preach. So I've been watching a lot on the on the Bible issue, and I've been having discussions on it a little bit. Um but I'm going to tell you where, where we basically are with this. If you, if you have any trouble figuring out where you stand on this Bible issue, I'm going to tell you what it really boils down to. It boils down to whether God preserved and gave us his book for us to have today or whether he expects us to go to the, quote, authorities and theologians and scholars to find out where it's at. That's what it really boils down to. Because obviously the side we're on, we believe God gave us an English translation in 1611 and perfected it. It's, it's very interesting. I'm not going to preach this as a doctrine. I'm just going to throw it out here for a thought. But, you know, when Brother Danny did this uh, series a few weeks back on the different set of manuscripts that the Bibles come from, our Bible comes from what? It's called the Textus Receptus, received text. The, the newer versions come from what the West Cotton Hort or the, um, there's other names for that text as well. Um, but it's two different lines of manuscripts. Now, the point I want to make about that is Psalms chapter 12 says that the words of the Lord are pure, purified seven times. What does that mean? Did you know there's been exactly seven translations of the Texas Receptus and the King James is the seventh one? That's right. Now, that's just, I'm not going to preach that as a doctrine, but I'm going to, uh, you know, it started out like with Tyndale, then down to the Geneva, and this is, yeah, brother, go ahead. Yep. That's right, seven years. Yeah, 1604, 1611, 1611, that's right. Um, so either that's, what, that's one of the reasons. It's not the only reason that we believe God gave us his word in English because quite honestly, it only makes sense that he would give it to us in the most widely used language in the world. Um, when you, but then you hear the people on the other side. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm saying they're misled on this. They'll say something like, well, all we have are translations, really, and none of them are perfect. And the, the, uh, the Word of God was only inerrant, without error, in the originals. But see, we don't have the originals. They don't exist. So 
What you're saying is no perfect Bible exists. And that's a problem because it says his word is settled forever in heaven. So how did he intend for us to know even what his word is? If his word's settled, we got to have it know what it is, folks. How does he expect us to know what it is if he don't give it to us? And you say, well, we just have to go to the scholars and see, and they have all these thousands of manuscripts. And did you know I actually learned something here recently? They believe that the correct, that there's no English translation that's perfect in its translation. I already knew that. But what I didn't know is a lot of these guys, they believe that the perfect renderings are out there, but one of them might be in this manuscript, another one might be here. You've got literally thousands of manuscripts, and they believe that within those many thousands, we could have a perfect Bible. We just, you know, but we're one variation from the other. We just don't know which one's right. Do you really think that's how the Lord did this? Do you really think the Lord just scattered his word out there among 5,000 manuscripts and said, okay, it's out there, now go figure it out. Go, you go figure out which one's right. And then we have to trust the scholars to tell us. No. The Bible says someone it's better to put confidence in the Lord or trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So it really boils down to who you trust. Do you trust God to give you his word or do you trust man to tell you it's out there somewhere, we'll get it figured out? Well, no, that's not good enough for me. If that's good enough for you, you're settling for less. The word of the Lord, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Folks, we got his word. We've got his word. Why do you think all every new Bible that comes out compares itself to this one? You know, it's funny to me, like when the ESV or something comes out, it don't compare itself to the New American Standard. And I mean, they always say, well, this is why it's better than the King James. Why is the King James always the standard they want to compare theirs to? Because they know, they even they know it's the one. Okay. Anybody got anything on that? Our time's gone. I'm going to stop right there. Anybody got a question or comment? All right. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you. And we thank you for this study in your word. And we ask you, God, to just help us be like David was, Lord, when he wrote this, Lord, that no matter what goes against us, Lord, we may be facing the hardest time of our life right now. There may be somebody here like that. But Lord, that we won't get discouraged. We won't quit. That we'll just trust in you and keep going on with you and keep obeying you. Lord, I pray you'll help us this morning. I pray you'll bless our pastor as he comes and preaches to us and give him the message and the words that you would have us to receive. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. One, two, three, four. This one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. All right, we got uh, three papers up here on this table. I want your name should be on at least one of them, maybe more. This is help for the youth rally, where we can depend on you for help, food, help, uh, clean up, serve, set up chairs, paint, all kind of stuff like that. Come up here and put your name on one of these list or more wherever we can use you because we got a big three weeks coming up all right go ahead brother
David sang the praises of the glory of Jehovah. Oh, preached that all is lost, save knowing Christ. Then John said he is precious while in I don't 
which stands for freedom, what it is worth. She stands in the harbor, Miss Liberty Call. Hi, right, y'all. Let's go. Hey, man, get me up, please, a little bit there, brother. Hey, everybody, get in this morning. Uh, get you a hymn book, turn to number 133. You ought to be able to sing this and mean it. If you can't, get your heart right first. No, number 133. Feel like traveling on. Number 133. 133. Let's sing it out real big and loud. Come on now. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. No pain nor death can enter there. I feel like traveling on. Sing. Yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Hey, man. Come on now, number two. It's glittering towers, the sun outshine. I feel like traveling on. That heavenly mansion shall be mine. I feel like traveling on. Say, yes, I feel. I feel like traveling home. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Hey, man. That's good. You mean that? Sing the third. Let others seek a home below. I feel like traveling on. Which flames devour or Waves or float, I feel like traveling on. Traveling on, sing it. I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. Feel like traveling on. Amen. On the last. The Lord has been so good to me. I feel like traveling on until that blessed home I see. Feel like traveling. Amen. Yes. I feel like traveling. <clears throat> My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Amen. Good to see everybody out on this uh, little wet day. Thank you for making your way out to the uh, services this morning. I already had a good Sunday school for you that missed it. It was real good. And, uh, and get in here next Sunday. Get here for Sunday school. You'll be blessed and enjoy it. I'm um, uh, screaming all week, preaching revival, and I was a little scratchy. It'll kick in here all right in a little bit. Uh, I've been doing that since I was 19 years old. I ain't, I ain't lost my voice yet. But uh, Lord, give me strength here in a little bit. I'll be all right. Um, I want to say I appreciate all of you who went down with the choir Friday night. We had, we had I guess, 50 people went down the revival Friday night all the way down to um, to wherever I was at, uh, Gastonia, and uh, ran low, and uh, uh, I appreciate that, appreciate that, that was a blessing to us, it was really a blessing to that church, and uh, people got help, so thank you uh, for going, we had a good time in the Lord, now, everybody knows, this is it, y'all, uh, we got less than three weeks, on the table here, there's three of these Neon yellow sheets. Make sure your name is on one or more of those sheets. I will help with the food. I'll help cut grass. I'll help with paint. I'll help set up chairs. I'll help just put your name and number down on one of these three sheets. And uh, we'll be having a food meeting tonight. All ladies 
and men who are going to help with the food. We'll be having serving hamburgers and hot dogs. Uh, Jason's going to get the funnel cake machine fired up and ready to go. And uh, we are really, really looking forward to that. And so don't, don't, uh, don't miss getting your name on one of these. Three. Be a part of it. Get involved. Get involved. If you don't do nothing but give, somebody gave me $100 when I walked in this morning, said this is for the youth rally. If that's all you can do and you can't come and work, just do that. It's Everybody pitch in and do what you can do, and then the job will get done. There's a lady called me from Florida down in Ocala, Florida, uh, yesterday evening. I have no idea who it is. She said, my son, we was planning a vacation to Texas, and my son wants to come to y'all's youth rally, and they changed their whole plan. I said, you done the right thing. I don't know where you was going to Texas, but you made a wise choice. Ain't nothing in Texas but your exes. Uh, for some, <laughs> but anyway, I just kidding. But uh, don't don't uh, don't miss getting signed up here for you for the youth rally help. We will be having bus meeting tonight. Also, yeah. all bus workers, bus drivers, uh, bus helpers, junior church tonight in the service after service tonight. So busy night. Very special message for this evening. So you don't want to miss that. I'm going to preach tonight out of one of the most rarest books in the entire Bible, the little book of Philemon, Philemon, some people calls it, Philemon. And that'll be tonight. You don't want to miss it. I've got like 20, 25 verses or whatever, 30. Uh, but anyway, that'll be tonight. Don't miss that. You, you don't hear that story a whole lot in church. So uh, don't miss tonight's service, okay? We got a lot going on, y'all. So uh, let's don't forget it. We're also going to be having a prayer meeting uh, Saturday night at 7 o'clock and singing and we're going to have a special youth visitation for all the young people on Saturday morning, May 27th. Uh, we're going to hit the streets, Walmart, flea market uh, and, and talk, talking up to youth rally, inviting people. That'll be on Saturday morning, May 27th, a week from this coming Saturday. So we got a lot to do, short time to get there. So let's enjoy the Lord this morning. Now, uh, I want you to uh, make everybody feel welcome this morning. Let's stand, turn around there and be friendly in the Lord. Everybody fellowship there just a little bit. Two, one, two. Test one, two. Come up. Test one, two. Get your name on these papers, y'all. I can't do it by myself. One, two. Test it. Right here, one, two. for the youth rally. He's four years old. All right. Amen. Come. All right, choir, come on. Bring somebody with you. sing an old one we sung the other night right quick then we're going to sing for all it's done so uh, let's uh, uh, I really like that it was 
Amen. We sang this down there at the revival the other night. It was a real blessing. Amen. Never shall forget the day. And I'm going to read some. Let's, let's get it here this morning. I never will. Don't ever forget being saved. I have never have forgot it. Never will forget it. Uh, let's uh, let's sing this morning. Amen. All right. Number 130. That's it. Number 130. Let's sing. Amen. Sometimes you just need to just lift your hands and praise the Lord for all that he's done. Don't take it for granted. There's a lot of people in the hospital. Good friend of mine, Larry Blake, when he comes, sits right back there in the back. He's in the hospital this morning. Been in and out of the hospital for, for weeks. And if God's been good to you, give you good help. Amen. You sing. Amen. Be a blessing to you today. Go ahead. Every morning when I wake up to see the sun Listen now. Oh. I can't help but think about the Lord And all the things He's done yep, He meets my every need Now He's been so, so good, good to me oh. I can't help but praise the Lord for all He's done hey. For all He's done Y'all sing it with us this morning, everybody. 
give this morning honor the Lord and uh, he'll bless you for it uh, let's do right serve God but with our money it is youth rally time which means big time expensive uh, we're advertising we're getting ready to hit the newspapers and radio stations this week and uh, we have flyers here on the table make sure you get some of these put them out and put them up at a place of business Everybody here knows somewhere you can put one of these. School locker. Uh, uh, say anything, so That's what everybody else does. I'm, uh, but I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, advertise, advertise. So take these things if you have a place of business or at work or somewhere and get these up. And the Lord bless you for that, okay? Now, let's everybody give this morning. Honor the Lord and he'll bless you for it. And uh, God will honor you're given. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us. Pray now that you'd bless this offering this morning. Multiply it, Lord. Meet the need of the youth rally. Take care of it, Lord, we pray. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. sure and get these announcements in your bulletin. This tells you what's going on. Uh, so uh, a lot of work goes into that, believe it or not. So a few hours and please get your announcements on there. Keep it within your Bible so you know what's going on. Now uh, we have a couple things right quick I need to do. First, we have a brand new baby. You know, you see them a year old and everything and you think they're little till you see a brand new one. And uh, this one's only a week old. Uh, young lady, one of our bus girls come. Where's she at back there? Has she got it in here? Stand up back there. Show us that little girl. Just one week old. Look at that. Amen. Let's give her a big hand. Isn't that a blessing? <laughs> Amen. All right. Now we have one uh, young man here. His birthday is today. I don't always do this, but he's he's more than one year old. He's like four. Uh, so uh, come on up here, uh, Brandon. He's going to Give it a little testimony. Uh, 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 I, <laughs> listen, now look at here. 
In case there's anybody got any ideas here this morning, he is my buddy. <laughs> and I have been his, and he's packing too. I don't believe I'd mess with him. You don't even need that, man. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people in here ready if anybody ever wants to start something. And no kidding, this boy, I've been his pastor about all his life. When he was four, was he four or five, Roger? Four years old and came home. Remember that, Carrie? He came home and spent the evening with the pastor and his daughters. And we took him over there to the Harbor Inn, and we ate so much fish, he got sick. And he's eaten a couple of meals since then when he was four years old. And he's in college now and got, went on a football scholarship, and he's taking a stand for the Lord in college. So maybe you can just tell us one of those stories. But and I'm going to preach so you know, it don't take all day. But uh, I no, I, I praise God. You know, people say youth rally don't work. People say young people don't get enough. You keep them in church. You keep them in church. You keep them coming. It'll sink in one of these days. So I want him to say something. Make sure he's got plenty of Well, first off, I just want to thank the Lord for saving me. You know, he saved me back when I was probably eight or nine. And it was actually at the youth rally when I got saved. And, uh, you know, like you said, I'm in college and uh, it's it's been rough, man. It's. You got people that are, uh, it's, well, I thought it wasn't going to be bad because it's a private school. It was a Methodist college, so they claim. And um, so I'll just tell you one of the stories. If y'all want to meet up with me after church and hear the rest of it, you know, that's cool. But um, but there's one that actually happened about a month ago. He claims to be a pastor. I'm not sure what he was at, what, like what kind of pastor he was, but he uh, he's actually the one that started the Rainbow Club at the school, which is like a diversity group of all the, you know, the LG, whatever, LGBT community. Uh, he started that. And so he was just talking about uh, what the fourth being was, you know, was. And he's like this trying to think rationally and try to be like, you know, uh, just all the people who are right, all the people who are wrong, just come together. And this fourth being is just this, you know, just this peaceful land and where everybody can just come together in peace. And so I raised my hand and I said, how do you call yourself a pastor? And you don't, and you don't know what's right and what's wrong. And I said, how do you, how are you going to sit here and tell these kids that, you know, there is no right and wrong, just come together and, hey. and have peace, but you call yourself hey. a pastor. So, I mean, it's just, it's just stuff like that. You know, I've had to stand up quite a few times in class and, you know, bring out the Bible, you know, double edged sword and had to fight. And, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's been a struggle, but it's also been kind of fun. So I, I like debating people like that, especially whenever they're ignorant about it. And, uh, <laughs> So it's just, uh, it's been, it's been a journey, man. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's not fun being in college. You know, I need to do, I need to get my degree, but man, the Lord's testing me. You know, he's, he's putting all these, you know, these obstacles on my path. And the only thing I can do is jump over them. So, I mean, uh, I just thank him for, for keeping me this far, keeping me in college, you know, and let me pursue my dream of, uh, you know, going to the law enforcement and, you know, hopefully something bigger than that, maybe federal, but, you know, I just thank him for everything he's done. You know, he's brought me through so much. So the only thing I can do is fight for him at least. Amen. So. brother. Amen. 21 years old today. Amen. Amen. I appreciate Brandon. 21 years old today. Hard to believe. That's been 17 years. Good night. Isn't that something? What about that? Amen. I appreciate him taking a stand over there for the Lord. Um, Jack Hiles, quote, the only difference between people that's been to college and people that's not been to college is they're di ignorant on different subjects. That's a quote for today. And that's not against education. Uh, nothing wrong with education as long as it's Bible-based education. Where it's anti-Bible, it's not education. It's damnation. So uh, we're going to take our Bibles this morning and turn to Joshua. The book of Joshua, chapter number 14. Take your Bible, please. Turn to the book of Joshua, chapter number 14. And I'm going to read an unusual story about an unusual man and preach a sermon on this subject. This message today will help everybody in here in some area of your life. If you'll listen to me for the next 30 minutes, this will help you, teenagers, boys, girls, mom, dad, in some area, whatever you apply it to, in your life. Joshua 14, and um, we'll look at verse number 6. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, there's the man we're going to be talking about this morning. Caleb, the
the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years. So he doesn't live in the desert 40 years. And now it's 45 later. He said, ever since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day four score and five years old. Four scores, 85 makes 85 years old. And yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. My goodness, there's just a role model, y'all. Now, therefore, give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how that the Anakim the giants were there and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be, the Lord will be with me that I shall be, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave Caleb unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. I want to preach this morning on the subject, give me that mountain. There's an unusual character here in the Bible by the name of Caleb, 85 years old. Most people would have gave up a long time ago. But here old Caleb is 85. He said, I was 40 years in the desert. I've been 45 out here. That makes me 85, Moses. He said, I want you to know, bye, cracky. He probably might have said that back then. That's what old people used to say. He said, I'm not done yet. And he said, I want you to give me that mountain right there. Somebody said, Caleb, you're 85 years old. Are you crazy? He said, uh, uh, don't, you know, you don't, he realized he was 85. Don't be like them people that think age is nothing. It is something. The older you get, the more you can tell it. I got one black guy get up and he said, uh, he says, age ain't nothing but a number. And the guy said, yeah, and King Kong wasn't nothing but a monkey. Uh, you know, uh, age, age is more than a number. You know how old you are this morning? Ever how old you are? People say, you're only as old as you feel. That ain't true. You're as old as you are. That's how old you are. And it don't matter how you feel. Some people are old at 20 and young at 80. And uh, like a man said one time, he got up and he said, I feel like I'm 17. And the fella stood up and said, you forgot what 17 feels like. That's your problem. So Caleb knew he wasn't 17, but he said, I'm 85, but I want that mountain. I don't know what mountain is in front of you. I don't know what kind of problem you may be facing this morning. I don't know what it is, but my message to you this morning is, don't you give up. Don't you quit. You take what God has for you. Do what God has for you. Don't listen to the critics. There was about 10 or 12 of them went up there and spied out the land. And every one of them said, we can't do it. There's no way we can do this. Caleb said, yeah, we can. I'm wholly fallen. The Lord, my God. And Caleb was the only one out of them men, Joshua and Caleb, that believed that they could take that mountain. The youth rally is a huge mountain. Every year, I feel like I can't, I can't do this. I can't do this. I, I just can't do it. Mom used to say that every Christmas. She'd say, now, I'm not doing this next year. I, it's too much trouble. I wind up doing all the work. Okay, and, 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 but here next year, she'd come, she'd do it again right up until she got to where she couldn't. Now, listen, 
I, I feel like that about the youth rally. Sometimes I feel like, Lord, I, how, I mean, I've been doing this 30 something years. I, how much more can I? And then something inside me comes up and says, take that mountain. Take that mountain. Go wholly follow the Lord thy God. And brother, you can do what God wants you to do. I'm telling you this morning, in the next three weeks, I plan on going in the strength of the Lord and taking that mountain that God has put in front of us. Now, the word Caleb means all or whole or wholehearted. That's what the word Caleb means. Most of those Hebrew names had meanings to them. And Caleb means wholeheartedly. Follow it. And brother, that's what he did. Now in history, he belonged to the tribe of Judah, same tribe Jesus came from. He brought back a faithful report and he survived in the wilderness and was good uh, for, the, for the, the work of God at 85 years old. Now, I want to use this like a picture of underdogs. Anybody who likes sports or plays sports knows what an underdog is. An underdog is a team that comes up that ain't supposed to win. The number one team supposed to win. But sometimes you have what we call an underdog team. And they'll come up and they'll fight and they'll rake and they'll scrape and they'll scratch and overthrow the number one team and win. It happens all the time. There's been teams that were not even uh, projected to be in the final two or three that wound up winning the Super Bowl. It's happened many, many times. There's been times when teams, or maybe especially in high school sports, that were not even rated, just went on some kind of Cinderella run, won three or four, two, and won the championship and became the champion. There's been times when a boxer was underrated and just believed that he could do it and got out there and just bam, and not the guy. I, I think about any, any kind of sport. Everybody who follows sports at all knows what I'm talking about. And the truth is, the truth is, unless you got your real, 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 real favorite team, we all sometimes pull for the underdog. Isn't that right? There's just something about us that likes like to see the big number one per, per guy getting knocked off. Uh, we like to see somebody just come up out of nowhere and bam, uh, win it. That's, that's encouraging. Uh, there's, there's times when people have been in war, lots of, lots of cases in war, like Israel in the Six-Day War, when they were surrounded by enemies, by outnumbered like 10 to 1, and won that war in six days. There's been times when people have been outnumbered a uh, hundred to one and somehow fought hard and things went in their favor and they won the battle. I think about uh, him, him playing football, uh, uh, Dax, uh, riding. Uh, Moses, some, anytime you're in a, when, when somebody's going to beat you and you're, you're trying to beat them, you know what you can do? You can do like Caleb and you could say, listen, I might be 85, I might be short, I might be little, I might be uneducated, I might be not as well off, I may not be as talented, but I'm telling you one thing, I can try just as hard as anybody, I can work just as hard as anybody, amen. I, I'm going to quote you some athletes this morning to sort of sort of prove my point. Uh, they, 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 somebody said this, you know who said this? There may be people in the world with more talent, but there can be nobody in the world that can work harder than I can at it. You listen? All you kids, listen. You in sports, any kind of competition, there may be people in the world with more talent, but they ain't nobody can work at it and hard, try harder than you can. You know who said that? Derek Jeter. And you know, they all have all kinds of quotes like that. I'll give you another quote. You know, listen to this. You have to expect things of yourself you have to expect things of yourself that you can before you can do them. You have to expect something before you can do it. So you said that? Michael Jordan. And what they were saying was, give me that mountain. I may be young. I may be little. I may be weak. But by the grace of God, I'm going to work and I'm going to try and I'm going to pray and I'm going to give it my dead level best to make it for the glory of God. Boy, if we had that attitude and everything we do serving God, we could turn this town upside down for the glory of God. Do you know that? If everybody in church, uh, there was 10 men 
Ten men said we can't do it. There ain't no way. Have you looked at how tall them guys over there? Look at them. Look at them. They're giants. Look at them. They have fit cities. Look at them. There's no way we can beat them. Caleb said, give me that mountain. Let's go, boys. They said, man, you're crazy. He said, I've seen the Lord keep me all these years. I've seen him do great and mighty things. I want that mountain. And boy, that old man, by the grace of God, I don't know about you, but that helps me this morning. Sometimes the devil will jump on you and say, you're never going to make it. Sometimes the devil will jump on you and say, you're done. Sometimes the devil will jump on you and say, your marriage is over. Sometimes the devil will jump on you and say, you might as well quit. You've been through a divorce. You've been through, you've got fired from a job. You, your house burned down. You've lost everything. You might, I'm telling you, there'll be something on the inside of a child of God that keeps on turning them, keeps on moving and saying, by the grace of God, I will not quit. I will not. Listen, let me tell you something about Caleb. And I'm gonna, I hardly ever do this, but I want you to turn to a verse of scripture. Turn back to Numbers chapter 14. Let's take just a minute, if you don't mind. And I want to say uh, about him first, he had a different spirit than the other guys around him. Caleb had a different spirit. Look at chapter Numbers, back in Numbers chapter 14. I'll read this one verse and then I'll, I'll not have you turn anymore. Uh, look at verse 24. Here's what he said about Caleb. Now, here's what made the difference. Numbers 14, 24. He didn't say he was stronger. He didn't say he was smarter. He didn't say he was more spiritual. He didn't say he had more ability. Here's what he said. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him. Isn't that an unusual thought? He had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully. There's your secret. Him will I bring into the land where unto he went, and his seed shall possess it. He said, Caleb, he's different from these other guys. All they do is sit around and say, well, we can't do this. Can't afford it. I just don't think it can be done. I just don't. You know, talk like that is poison. It's poison in your family. It's poison in your church. It's poison at work. You know, because everybody gets what we think. Old Caleb jumped up and he said, I'll tell you one thing. I'm fully following the Lord my God. And I believe if God wants us to do it, we can do it. I'm telling you, listen, there's people that prophesied we'd never have a youth rally. There's people that said, there ain't no way. And every year, a thousand of people flock in over there at that building and fill that place full. And people get saved, have been saved by the hundreds at that youth rally. You know why? Because there are still a group of people that say, give me that mountain. Listen, it's a long way up from here to where we need to be in three weeks. It's going. It ain't going to be easy. It, the Lord never said it'd be a rose garden. He never said. But I'm telling you, I, I, I'm going. I'm going. I wish you'd go with me. I hope you'll go. But by the grace of God, I'm saying, Lord, give me that mountain, and by His grace, we'll, we'll see it be done. Amen. He was active. He was zealous. They said it can't be done. He said, by the grace of God, it will. They said, we'll never make it. He said, we sure will. They said, you're too old, Caleb. He said, well, I'm just as strong as I was when I was 40. He said, I'm the same as when I was 45 as I am right now. And he said, by the grace of God. He said, I can't do it by myself, but there's somebody bigger than me that's going to help me. I feel the same way this morning. I can't do nothing by myself. I couldn't do nothing when I was 40 by myself. But there's somebody bigger than me that helps me and walks with me and talks with me. He had a different spirit. I'd rather have 10 men that says, by the grace of God, we can do it. Let's get this done. Than 50 that sit around and say, I just don't think, I, I just don't see no sense in all that. We can't afford to run these buses and pick up all them kids. No, you'll never do nothing with that kind of spirit. Let me say something about, secondly about Caleb. He chose the difficult. He chose the difficult. He didn't just play somebody his own age. He said, give me them big ones over there. That's who I want to play against. And there's your man right there. He deliberately chose, listen to me, anybody in sports, anybody in college, anybody trying to make something work, he deliberately chose the hard way. Here's an easy trail. He took a hard trail. Here's a little guy. If I go over to the gym, 
uh, on that thing. And there's a bunch of fourth and fifth graders in there. And I come over and say, come here, boy. I play him one-on-one -on -one and beat him. And I play him one-on-one -on -one and beat him. I, play him. I can come back and say, I beat 10 guys one-on-one. -on -one, and I'm going to feel like a dog on the inside. Show me that college player. Bring him on. You say, Brother Danny, what if you don't win? I'll tell you one thing. I'm going to choose the difficult. You know why? You know why you play against people better than you are? Because it makes you better. You know why you hang around people more spiritual than you are? It makes you more spiritual. You know why you hang? You know why a smart young man likes to hang around preachers? And you know why a smart young lady likes to be around godly women in the church? Because they know that's what I need to be. I need to think like them. I need to uh, feel like them. I need to look at things like they look at. Don't hang around somebody dumber than you are. It'll bring you down. Caleb said, I'm choosing the difficult way. You know what our generation wants? Our generation wants success without work. Our generation wants to win without sacrifice. They want instant riches without paying a price. Isn't that true? People, your kids getting married nowadays have got more stuff than their mom and daddy had when they've been married 10 years. They expect everything brand new, right? And we're ruining this generation of young people. They want instant riches. They want muscles without exercising. Guess you have to take dope to do that, don't you? Then it ain't real. As soon as you quit taking dope, you go back to flab. I'm telling you, brother, uh, they, they, want, uh, uh, they want cars that never tear up or have payments. They want grass that never needs mowing. They want beds that you never have to make up. Our generation says everything should be perfect. Everything should just fall right in my lap. Our generation before me and the generation before that, they knew if you got something, you had to work for it. If you got somewhere, you, had to, you can't lay in the bed all day and, and make a good living. You can't pay bills and, and do it. Listen, them athletes, I'll, I'll talk more about them in a minute, but do you, do you realize this morning that those athletes you see out on the football field, they put forth a tremendous effort to get like that. Them guys just didn't, didn't just grow up and get muscles that big and become that fast. They train, they, Lord, they, throw, they run or they throw up. I, I know you've seen them uh, running and training and, and they make them go up steps, you know, about 50 of them, and then back down, and up the steps, back down. Uh, listen, that's not fun. It's not fun. If you live in the woods, uh, you know, you run uphill, uh, uh, run uphill, downhill. My driveway is just like this. And uh, I, I remember one day I said, I wonder how many times I can run up my driveway. This has been a long time ago. I said, I'm going to run up it four times. And one time you can feel it burning right here. And you know what? Uh, then I done it again. And I did it four times before I was going to die. I was straight up. I, I'm telling you, bro. But you know what? And that's not fun while you're doing it. But in that game, when one step might make the difference between winning and losing, running up them steps kicks in and gives you that little bit more endurance, that little bit more faith, that little bit more strength to make that. And that's how games are won. Them football players, did you hear? Listen to this. Some of you ain't going to believe this, but I just read it popped up on my phone. I don't know how it does that, but stuff pops up on my phone. And I, and I said, I want to read that. There was a, a, a basketball player from the Philadelphia 76ers uh, just happened this week. And he was caught on the bench. Wasn't even in the game. He wasn't even on the floor. He was on the bench and he had his phone out and him and some, a buddy was looking at something on his phone and they find him and he had to apologize in front of the whole country on TV. Did y'all hear about that? I thought, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. So, where would you be if we had that rule here? He was fined thousands of dollars. And you know what his excuse was? His daughter was sick and he's checking on her. And they said, no excuse. The rule is, when you're on that bench, you're sitting there and you're cheering your team up. You notice now that they all stand up. You know, if one falls down, they all go run and pick him up. If we had half that much dedication in church, Lord, we'd be there. You know what happens when somebody falls in church? We kick them and say, I couldn't believe that. I knew there's a hypocrite all along. And if somebody falls down on that ball court, all four of them run and pick that guy up. 
Lord, listen, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves if a basketball team's got higher standards and more dedication than we have serving God right here in the house of the Lord. Well, hey, the man didn't do nothing but look at his phone and they find him. That's why we ought to, that's what, listen, we're in the army, people. We're in God's army. We ought to have at least as much dedication. I'd feel bad if I could try harder to win a ball game than I could be to see God's power come down at that youth rally and souls be saved and change their eternal destiny. You say, well, what can I do? You don't have to know. Just one little bitty thing. Him holding that phone out probably didn't make them lose. I think they did. I don't, I don't know. But it probably didn't. Them guys out there probably didn't know it. But what they're saying is, that's a bad testimony. We're out here fighting, even in the playoffs, and you sitting there playing, that shows your mind, your heart is not in what we're doing. Man, that spoke to my heart. I preached Ronnie's funeral yesterday. Ronnie Loftus, you sat right back there on that back row. He'd sit right back there every Sunday and just have on a white shirt. He never did wear a tie or nothing. Y'all remember Brother Ronnie? He never knew he was here. That was a good man, I'm telling you. He sat there like that. Ronnie was my friend. I visited him Tuesday and prayed with him. And Wednesday, his son called me, Mikey, and said, Daddy's gone home be the Lord. And I preached his funeral yesterday. And I could stand up there and say, Ronnie loved God. He read the Bible all the time. You know what he told me? He told me the other day, he said, Danny, I've always stuck with you because you give it to us on the plate. He said, you put it on the plate so we can eat it. And he said, you put it out there. And he said, I've always appreciated you. He said, I can't live without the gospel. He said, I've got to have the gospel. I've got to hear the gospel. I've got to understand the gospel. Can somebody say amen, please? I was wondering about y'all. I preached yesterday, and I said, he's in heaven. You know how I know he's in heaven? One Sunday morning, many, many years ago, up in Marion, before we ever even built that new church in Marion, we had an old building up on the hill. And I had an office upstairs, I was praying, the old block building, and I was up there praying, and we had visited him and tried to get him to come to church. We had witnessed to him and said, why don't you come to church? And he wouldn't, he's lost. Worked at CNA up there all these years. Worked there 40 years at CNA. Man, his boss man said, if I had a whole plant full like him, I could let, let half these people go. That's what kind of man he was. And that morning, his, we had, me and somebody let his wife, which they weren't even married yet, to the Lord on visitation. Well, she met him, they got married. And one Sunday morning, they came to church. And I was upstairs in, in my old office praying. And for some reason, I just happened to look out the window. And I saw him park across the street and start walking across the street. And I went, glory to God, hallelujah. Ronnie's here. Amen. Save him today, Lord. And about that time, his wife ran across a rose bush or something and, and tore her hose and just got all upset. And he was saying, and she was, oh my goodness. And, and they turned around and was leaving go get in the car. It's true. And when I seen them hit that car, I run, throw my Bible down, run down the steps, and I run out in front of the yard and said, hey! They turned around and said, where are you going? They was leaving to go home. Devil's trying to keep them coming in there. And then they were sort of embarrassed. I said, come on in, it's all right, don't worry about it. He's, we got nails in these pews in here to tear your hose worse than that. That's true. And, and, and they came in, and I preached that morning. Ronnie walked down the aisle and got saved and lived for God till the other day when he left this world. Straight as a stick. Now I wonder, what, listen, what could I have said at that funeral if I hadn't went down them steps that morning? If I hadn't went down there and hollered at them. See, you might think, I can't do nothing big. I can't do nothing important. Listen, people, that little holler kept that man out of hell. Just that one little thing. We think preachers have to organize some big, the, the, the new man of youth camp out there. You know, people say, oh, you got a big group together and organize that. Huh. You know what I did? I stand in the bank one morning. And a woman who worked there that I didn't even know, I, I, I mean, I knew her face, started coming to church right after that. And she said, Danny, she said, I want to show you something. Took it out there. We bought, bought a youth camp. Thousands of people have been saved, still are. And I said, uh, what made you come to our church? She said, you were standing in the bank one morning and you did something. 
And she said, when you did that, God spoke to me and said, you need to go to that church and help him. So I said, what I did? She never did tell me what I done. Pick my nose. <laughs> give somebody a track. I don't know what I did. I used to be bad. I'd just stop and pray, you know. I, one time I seen somebody in, in a store, and uh, this was a long time ago, and I said, uh, they said, pray for me. And I said, okay, I can grab your hands. Said, Dear Lord, I pray. <laughs> trying to jerk away, you know. I, that man, and they told somebody, where it said, I saw him, and he prayed for me right there in public. And, uh, but anyway, what I'm saying is, it don't take a big bunch of talent. Just be holy following the Lord. Did you know if you wholly follow the Lord, the Lord will use you like that. He'll use you in ways you don't. I ain't no, I ain't no, big, I ain't no organizer. I ain't a businessman. I'm just follow the Lord wholly. I try to. And when you do that, he'll use you. He wholly follow the Lord. We had a girl many years ago did not graduate high school. Come from the poorest of poor families over there in what we call stump town. One day we had a big we had a big day at church, and I said, "Everybody go, let's go, let's work hard, let's visit." And she she wanted to be a bus captain. She said, "I want to be a bus captain. I want I want to help kids that had to grow up like I had to grow up. I want to be able to help little boys and girls that don't have none." I said. Wonderful, wonderful. So she went out and started visiting, and she set a goal. She said, I want that mountain. And I, I mean, she worked, and she worked, and she got people to help her, and they went out visiting all over that community. And I mean, all over town. And they told me that evening. Somebody called and said, listen, she's going to have a mob. She's going to have a mob. Uh, she said, I want that mountain. And boy, she worked, and she worked, and she prayed. That girl, she probably... She probably couldn't probably pronounce most of the hard words in the Bible. Probably couldn't. She had no formal education, maybe junior high at the very most. No, no stable home life. Families all to pieces. They rolled in that Sunday morning and had 105 people on the bus. Not counting people that drive cars. I'm talking, you talk about packed. They were out the windows. Their heads were they were crammed in the aisle. They opened the door and four or five fall out. I like that. I never seen so many young'uns in all of my life. Do you know what she had? She didn't have a lot of education. She couldn't sing. She didn't have nice clothes. She wore old print dresses and was poor. But she said, "Bless the Lord, give me that mountain," and she got it by the grace of God. Wasn't that a blessing? Let me say three this morning. I'm done. He holy. Followed the Lord. He went by the right rule. I'll give you a quote. It's not the size of the man. It's the size of his heart. You know what it takes to be a success? Heart, brother. Who said that? Evander Holyfield. I'll give you another quote. Always make a total effort even when the odds are against you. You know who said that? Arnold Palmer. You don't go by the trends of the times. See, you know what the trend was? I get tired of hearing it. Brother Derek hit on it a little bit in Sunday school. I get tired of hearing it. Well, the world's changing, so the church must change uh, to set the world. Now, it depends on what you mean by change. I mean, we use technology. We use different. I mean, I'm all for air conditioning. I'm all for uh, you. I'm putting sermons out, and I'm, I believe in all of that. But when it comes to changing what we believe, what we preach, what we understand that book to say, no, we don't go with the trends of this world. That's what's wrong with churches uh, this morning. And many of them are just going right. They're not. They're not with the world. They're just you know 20 years behind it. In another 20 years, where the church is going to be? You know what Caleb did? He said, no, no. All of y'all say, but Caleb, the world's different. You can't believe like that no more. He said, I still believe it. I'm going to wholly follow the Lord my God. I'm going to follow him. And if I fail, I fail. Ladies and gentlemen, are you looking at me this morning? I, I'm, I, as long as I'm a pastor here at this church, by the grace of God, we're still going to believe the same book. We're still going to preach the same blood of Jesus Christ. Get you to heaven. We're still going to. Listen, if I ever quit preaching that, check me in the nut house. I've lost my mind because I'm not changing what I believe. Say amen right there. You say, but Brother Danny, the world's saying, I know it. But you know what Jesus said? Thy word is true from the beginning. Thy word is truth. I, I, know, that we, I know that we have to make adjustments here and there and all of that, but we will not change. Ch Caleb, 
don't you know that, the, that you're out of style and you're old-fashioned? We can't go up there and fight them, John. He said, I'm going, boys. I'm going to holy fight. You can sit around here and be chicken out if you want to. You can let the people laugh at you if you want to. I'm going! And God give him that mountain. God give him that mountain. Amen. Tell you a little story here. I'm, I'm through a couple right quick. When I was little, don't laugh at me. When I was little, my mom told us stories. Now, for somebody else in here that your mom told you this story, you know, I'm, you're, I'm, you're going to think I'm a little baby when I tell you this. But she used to tell us a story about a little choo-choo train. And the name of it was, I think I can. I think I can. How many of you ever heard that story? Right? No, wife. Uh, that'll preach. And, and it was like, ch -ch -ch -ch, little train trying to go up this hill. And I always felt so sorry for it. The way she'd tell it, I'd think, that poor little train, why don't somebody help it? It tore my heart out. I was four or five years old. And, and she said, ch -ch -ch, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And, and every time she'd tell it, I thought, is he going to make it? He made it every time, but I'd always think that. Y'all remember that story? You poor, ignorant young people now. There's no hope for you. All you know how to do is move your thumbs. That's all you know how to do. The dumbest generation in history is coming up. All they can do is have fast thumbs. They got the fastest thumbs in history. Congratulations. You really accomplished something. A little train went up and said, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I think. I think I can. 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 And he got to the top. And he started going down the hill and he said, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could. I thought, glory to God. That's me. I've been that little choo-choo all my life. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Paul said it. I, I can do all things through Christ with strength. He was just a little choo-choo. He probably wrote that story. I think I can. You say, Brother Danny, I'm about ready to give up. I think I can. You say, I'm about ready just to get a divorce and forget the whole thing. I think I can. You say, I'm just, we fight all the time at home and I come to church and I don't get nothing and, and, and maybe my, my wife left me and she's gone and I'm all by myself. The devil's hitting me. From I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I this story about this man who loved the Bible. Loved it, loved it, loved it. I'm preaching out of a brand new Bible this morning. I used to my reading Bible at home. Y'all don't see many Bibles like that right there. Man, raise your hand back there, Tommy. Man brought me this other night. He's from Gastonia. And that Bible's printed in the Netherlands, you say? And I looked it up and it's from Scotland. You don't find Bibles like that. Calf skin. It's a very expensive Bible. And... When I looked at that, I thought, this come from the old country over there. And you, would, you ought to believe they got the real, see them red pages? You don't find them like that no more. It used to be, a, that's calf skin. That's very, very salt. Last, it'll last the rest of my life and many more to come. And I just wanted to bring it and preach out of it this morning. And I, I thought about this Bible. And this guy loved the Bible. And he read it all the time. And one day he was fooling around at work and got into some chemicals and it blew up and hit him in the face and, and just ruined his face, put out both his eyes, killed the nerves and his fingers and this thing blew up. It, it, it numbed both hands and his eyes were gone. And he said the most disappointing thing he had during that story was he couldn't read the Bible no more. He said, I want to read the Bible and I can't. And they brought him a Bible and he could, he can see, and they got him one in Braille, you know, that raised print for blind people. And he put his fingers over it and he couldn't feel it because he didn't have no nerve in his, in his fingers and he couldn't feel it. And they said, you'll never read the Bible again. And it broke his heart. And he said, just let me kiss it. Just let me kiss it. And they put it up and he went. And he took it and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he felt it. 
And he said, I can feel that with my tongue. And that guy, true story, took his tongue and learned how to read those Braille letters. And a story said he read the whole Bible through four times with his tongue. You know what that man had? He had a right spirit like Caleb. He had one of these attitudes. That's what God wants me to do. That's where I'm going. And nothing by the grace of God is going to stop me. I want that now. I don't know what you're facing this morning, but we got too many people in church that give up too easy. There's all, you ever heard the old saying, where there's a wheel, there's a way? That's true, most of the time. You got a desire to serve God this morning. You ask God to give you that spirit of Caleb. Say, by the grace of God, I want that now. Let's stand by our heads for prayer. We got a mountain facing us next few weeks. That song says, today I faced a mountain oh so tall. Don't know what's waiting on the other side, but I know he'll see me through. It's in the Savior's hands. She's playing softly this morning. I wonder how many just meet me around this altar just for a minute this morning. Say, preacher, I want to I want to try a little harder. I'm going to stick in there. I'm 40 years old, but I ain't quitting. I'm 45, but I ain't quitting. I'm 50, but I ain't quitting. Man told me one time, he said, my wife's too old to work the bus ministry. She's 50. Lord, that just you just start and get to the age where you make a good bus worker. I'm 60, preacher. You ain't too young. Caleb was 85. I don't think there's anybody in here older than 85. Miss Dot's homesick. Amen. I want that mountain. I want to be a soul winner. I want to be a Bible teacher. I want to be a witness. I want to be a singer. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this wonderful story this morning of the man Caleb. And when he did that and took that mountain, he had no idea that that story would be in the Bible and it would be encouraging thousands of people right here in 2019. For this message will go around the world. He had no idea. And Lord, many times we take a stand and we have no idea how it might affect people around us and to the ends of the earth, Lord. We don't know. But help us to have the attitude he had. Not follow the trends of this world that are against the Bible. And be faithful to you and wholly follow the Lord our God. Well, thank you for what you do. Bless these on the altar this morning. Some of them are probably facing insurmountable odds. Maybe they're the underdog. God give them the grace to win. God give them the grace to overcome the obstacles and win the victory for the glory of God. Lord, if there's somebody here praying for a mate, if there's somebody here praying for health, if there's somebody here praying for spiritual strength, a victory over some sin, Lord, if there's somebody up here praying over some, some obstacle that they're up against, dear God, give them victory this morning. Give them faith and help them to realize they, they want that mountain and take it for the glory of God. Have mercy on us, O oh Lord. Bless our church as we attempt to, to give us that mountain here in the next three weeks at Youth Rally. We'll thank you and praise you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Are these still praying? Then wait just a few seconds this morning. Just continue to pray for these in the altar. Amen. We do have uh, plenty, plenty of these youth rally flyers here on the table. We got uh, two different sizes of them. Uh, take some of these. I have some letters right here. If you know a youth group that's got the letter, the flyer, and everything ready to go, all you have to do is put the address on there and send it to them. Got some of them. We got these flyers. Make sure them's real attractive. They get a lot of attention, but they ain't getting it here on the table. So help. I need somebody to help me with these. If somebody's got some time and will take a whole day, a whole day, and put up several hundred of these, we'll buy you a tank of gas. Get these out. So let me know if somebody can do that. Then uh, these big ones over here are for your local mall, Dollar General. Put them up and, and take them places, and uh, God will bless you, okay? All right, now there's three three papers here. Make sure you get signed up. because We're going to have a meeting tonight about the food. Tonight, after church, about who's helping what in the food. So get on this list here, and we'll get that settled. It's on, y'all.
It's a home, 19 days. I'm ready to go. What are you boys going to do? You come up here to give me some money for my birthday? You're going to come up here to sign them papers? Get you throw. Oh, you did. Oh, you already signed it. That's good man right there. All right. You have to put them out now. Put them on one. Stick one on your locker. You can, you can only take what you put up, okay? On your locker. That's good. <laughs> I appreciate them boys. That ought to make some rest of y'all get on the ball. Hey, Amen. All right. Let's bow our head and we'll be dismissing prayer. Six o'clock this evening. You're going to hear something you ain't never heard before, so don't miss it. All right? Amen. Jimmy dismisses. <laughs>